Well, um, it's great to be together. As I thought about today, as I look forward to today, there were a few things uh, that really excited me about having both of our speakers on campus. One was that I, I think that it highlights one of the real strengths of a Georgetown College education, and that is that we do aspire to educate not only students, uh, your minds, but also your hearts. Uh, Emerson said a mind once expanded can never contract, and I think that's true for a heart as well. A heart once expanded can never contract. And today is one of those days where we try to, to speak to both. Secondly, at Georgetown College, I know it's true that uh, we offer our faculty academic freedom, meaning that they have the, the great responsibility and the great privilege of teaching whatever it is to you students that they feel like you need to know in order to be successful in graduate school or to be exposed to as you move out into society to become the leaders that we know that you all will be. We do offer that to our faculty members uh, because we are a college, we're not a church. Uh, we are committed to our Christian faith that is important to the institution. But again, our role is different than that of a local congregation. Uh, at Georgetown, we do care greatly, again, about reason, and we also care deeply about faith. And I think at an institution like ours, we're trying to push these two things as closely together as possible to provide you the most comprehensive kind of education. And it is a championship level education of the heart and mind. It is a transformational education. And I think, too, it's the kind of education, hopefully, that once you graduate from Georgetown, we'll see you put into practice things like mercy, uh, love with action, justice and peace, putting those things together. So we're thankful for our speakers. We welcome you back to campus. We look forward to what you have to offer us this afternoon after a wonderful lecture this morning. Thank you, faculty, for organizing today. And for the donors who help to make uh, such things possible, we always want to express our gratitude. Thank you very much. Thank you. The Danford Thomas Lecture is actually based on a gift by the family of Rhodes B. Thomas, an early faculty member at Georgetown College. Uh, his family memorialized his influence by donating some money to fund a lecture that is the longest running lecture at Georgetown College. And we're really grateful to have that gift, that family still represented in, in the person of uh, Horace Hambrick and his wife Willow Hambrick. Uh, please join me in, in thanking them for this gift over the years. You'll see in the information on the, on the handout that there have been some very notable speakers uh, in the line of the, the lecturers provided by the Danfer Thomas Memorial, including uh, Helen Keller, we, we talked about that. The actual Helen Keller was here. Um, today we have John Slavitt. Uh, he is a, a, a program associate at the uh, American Academy for the Advancement of Science. Um, he is the director, and you can read right there, uh, for the Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion. Uh, he helps organize or funds a program to bring seminaries and science together. That's one of the, the things that he does. He also, uh, in addition to his public role, he's also an author. Um, so here's a, a book recently published, Faith and Science uh, at Notre Dame. It's sort of the story of the teaching of evolution also at Notre Dame and how that developed. Um, so he's a great scholar. We've had a busy day. I've worked him really hard. <laughs> you know, you get uh, you come to Georgetown, we get your, we got our money's worth. He's, I think he's talked to three classes so far. He's going to talk to some more tomorrow. So please join me in welcoming John Slavery. Thank you so much. Um, well, thank you so much for having me here um, at Georgetown College. It's been a real it's been a real pleasure so far talking to all the uh, all the classrooms. Really made me miss teaching. I was just telling him a few uh, a few minutes ago because I work in my administrative role right now um, at AAAS. And so AAAS, the group I work for, is the, is the organization that publishes the scientific journal Science and the whole science family of journals. It also has a really large nonprofit side which focuses on programs on science and public engagement. So the program that I work with, the Dialogue on Science, Ethics, and Religion, has two main parts. One is to reach out to religious communities um, and helping them to interact with science better, which is one of the ones that I, that I manage a large grant for that side. And then on the other side of it is to actually reach out to scientists all around the US and Canada and helping them to be able to reach out to religious communities and understanding the intricacies and the nuances of doing that work. 
Um, and so my, my particular project is called Science for Seminaries, um, as you just mentioned, and, and this is really a pedagogical project. And it's focused on um, helping seminaries and seminary professors understand and articulate the nuances of modern science from psychology to biology to quantum physics. And at its core, the project aims to help seminarians uh, from all traditions better interact uh, with the modern world of science. And this is the world that I want to talk about today, the possibilities of faith in a world of science. And so the world of faith, is, as, as we all know, is, is thousands upon thousands of years old. Right? So, so faith goes back pretty much as far as recorded human history. But the world of science is not. So, I mean, people have been doing scientific -y things for thousands of years, but the world of, of modern science is just a couple hundred years old. And if we limit that even more and we add in technology, um, we can talk about 75 years since the first computers, 30 years since the internet was made commercial, and just 13 years since the first iPhone came out. And as we all sit here with, I, with uh, smartphones in our pockets, we can see just how quickly the world of science is changing, the world of science technology is changing. And yet, despite its newness, no one here would debate this is a world of science. We have, we have entered into what this world is, especially in the North American context, especially in the context of a wealthy nation like ours. It is a world of science and technology that we live in. Um, you know, leaders of every university, government, and military rely on modern science. Even some of those who resist some discoveries of science, like climate change, rely readily on other scientific discoveries to manage all sorts of pieces of state. So in this modern scientific world, the role of faith is continually changing. And religious communities around the world are struggling with how to, how to apply and encounter this techno-scientific world. And so, in order to talk about the possibilities of faith, um, I want to begin by discussing the origins of the modern debate about faith and science. So, instead of a, uh, instead of a typical history about creation and evolution, um, I'm going to talk about another aspect of faith and science that profoundly influences our present understanding. And this is Western European cultural and biological progressivism, known both in the 19th century and today as racism. Now, in the mid-19th century, racist ideas pervaded pretty much everything, both in Western Europe and the colonized lands of the Americas and Africa. Atheists and Christians alike owned enslaved people in the Americas, as did prominent scientists, politicians, and philosophers. While political revolutions raged in Europe, the Industrial Revolution brought remarkable advances, advances in technology and wealth largely on the backs of the enslaved. Into this social context, Charles Darwin deposited his theory of evolution by means of natural selection in 1859. Now at the time of publication, most scholars still believed in the immediate creation of all human life by God or by nature with a capital N. Some, like Darwin, believed that all humans were one species, an idea called monogenism. Others, like David Hume, Louis Agassiz, and Josiah Knott, believed that humans were created as multiple species with different levels of intelligence, a theory called polygenism. While most abolitionist anti-slavery advocates were monogenists and most pro-slavery advocates were polygenists, there were exceptions. Plenty of people who believed in monogenism including many abolitionists, held that white Europeans carried the ideal form of humanity. And many who believed in polygenism, that all humans started from multiple different species, were in fact abolitionists themselves. <coughs> Indeed, however, in the, in the final line of origin of species, Darwin himself hammered the first nail in the coffin of polygenistic science with a lofty vision of universal common ancestry for all living beings. And he says, there is a grandeur in this view of life with its several powers, having been originally breathed by the creator into a few forms or into one, and that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. So you can already see there this, this push for 
from, from a single idea. Despite inaccuracies, and there are many inaccuracies in Darwin's texts and fierce opposition, his blend of novel hypotheses, expansive taxonomic work, and good rhetoric transformed the scientific world within a few decades. By the late 19th century, only a few supporters of polygenism remained, but the philosophical, theological, and scientific racism that had made polygenism so popular was soon drawing people to a new cause, eugenics. Eugenics is the Greek, it comes from a Greek word for well-bred. And it was given its name in 1883 by Darwin's cousin, Francis Galton, who was also the creator of the IQ test. And Galton gained widespread support for eugenics, the idea that we should selectively and purposefully breed better humans, better biological humans. He gained widespread support by arguing theologically that eugenics, for example, was a proper application of the gospel parable of the talents, while also arguing culturally that Darwin's idea of natural selection helped explain why white European men had conquered the world and were thus the most advanced examples of humanity. So this intermingling of racism, science, philosophy, theology, and politics laid a terrible groundwork for mainstream scientific thought in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. For Galton and most of the educated elite, including the company that I now work for, AAAS, the program of eugenics allowed humans to do intentionally what nature does randomly, favoring the most biologically capable or the fittest, and gradually ridding the world of the unfit. Between 1883 and 1939, the year World War II began, eugenical philosophies, theologies, and laws spread like wildfire. So this is a, a logo of the eugenics record office in 1921. It says, eugenics is the self-direction of human evolution. Before the rise of Nazi Germany, the most potent application of eugenics was in the United States, whose ruling class held tightly to racism, xenophobia, and cultural progressivism. This included campaigns to encourage the reproduction of the fittest human specimens, celebrations of the fittest babies, efforts to determine, via Galton's IQ test, the most fit humans. But it also included forced sterilization and anti-miscegenation laws, forced birth control, forced abortions, concentration camps, unethical scientific experiments, especially on black and other non-white communities. Beyond, beyond the United States, eugenics played into the hands of powerful people with sinister agendas around the world. In Canada and Mexico, anti-indigenous biases determine the nature of the most eugenical laws. In South Africa, Tanzania, Namibia, Kenya, Rwanda, and Burundi, anti-black and anti-indigenous racism motivated both sterilization and anti-miscegenation laws, as well as concentration and death camps. In most of Europe, as well as Russia, China, Iran, Australia, and New Zealand, the eugenics movement channeled long-established hostility to Jews, Africans, indigenous peoples, women, immigrants, and LGBT individuals. In all of these countries, including, including the United States, people with disabilities and the poor were among the first to be sterilized, silenced, or killed. Thousands of scientific experiments were performed on people against their wills, and countless laws inspired by eugenics were passed in the name of scientific progress. The genocidal actions of Nazi Germany, of which we're all well aware, and all German-controlled countries were uniquely horrific in their implementation of eugenical ideas, but Hitler's program was largely inspired by the language and laws of the American eugenics movement. Now, it's important to remember that eugenics spread so quickly because of its standing as an accepted <coughs> application of a scientific theory, and that Christians played a large role in the dissemination of eugenics. Galton and many others used explicitly theological language to argue for eugenics from the beginning. As historian Christine Rosen writes in a book called Preaching Eugenics, quote, one of the largest standing committees of the American Eugenics Society in the first three decades of the 20th century was the Committee on Cooperation with Clergymen, end quote. In fact, clergy of many religious traditions joined in the cause, writing, preaching, and lecturing widely in support. Fundamentalist Protestants and anti-modernist Catholics were notable exceptions to this, both groups opposing both evolution and eugenics. 
Eugenics was largely supported by moderate and liberal Christians who embraced science because they believed it was on the side of social progress. The same people who supported some variety of eugenics often championed progressive political causes. Such figures included, unfortunately, because you just mentioned her name, Helen Keller, <laughs> Winston Churchill, Teddy Roosevelt, and the Jesuit Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Now, in short, if you accepted Darwin's evolutionary theory in the early 20th century, you probably supported some version of eugenics. This does not mean that you supported concentration camps, but you probably supported some version of the intentional self-direction of human evolution. Now, things changed very quickly after the war. Now, this is, anybody's ever used the Google Books Ingram viewer? It's a, it's a really, really helpful thing for digital humanities. And this actually shows the, the frequency of the word eugenics in English books published between 1860 and 2012. So you can see it really jumps up after 1900, and then there's a really sharp fall right after 1940, and then the most recent uptick is sort of the studies of the past as it goes along. But you see, it never quite goes away. It's always there. So while many scientists continued to argue against the equality of all humans, so a bunch of scientists actually wrote UNESCO in 1950 complaining about their statement on the equality of all humans for scientific reasons, the tide of public opinion had turned. In the Protestant and Catholic worlds, people of faith split into two groups. Catholics began to accept evolution even while a strong contingent was wary of science. And Protestants largely stayed in the same groups of the early 20th century. Conservatives were wary of both science and social programs, while mainline Protestants shedded the ideas of eugenics, but kept their support of science and social progress and tended not to talk about their past of supporting eugenics. In the wake of this mid-century change, professional theologians who supported evolution began to write about the possibilities of science and theology, largely ignoring the legacies of eugenics, while professional theologians who were wary of evolution continued to use eugenics as a reason to distrust Darwinian-based science, trends on both sides of the aisle that continue to the present day. So this is an example. So this is a Ken Ham book called The Lie of Evolution, and Ken Ham explicitly will, will hammer eugenics as a reason to distrust evolution over and over and over again. And it was present in the Scopes trial, so it's not, like, it's not like he's lying that it wasn't there. On the other side, Ian Barber, who wrote really what's considered the first book on the contemporary science and religion dialogue, there is not a word about eugenics in there. The word doesn't even exist in this book. And in fact, there's a huge book on creationism by this <coughs> historian, a really wonderful man named Ron Numbers, um, who I think there is one page where the word eugenics happens twice, and it is a 700-page book and this entire history of creationism. And it sort of, it really shows you how this, this idea has played out in the contemporary discussion. So now we have a basic overview of the past <coughs> and coming to the present moment where how we think about science and theology, I wanna to move to the contemporary place of evolution in society today. All right, so you're not gonna be able to read this unless you have really, really great eyesight. Um, but this is a chart from Gallup Poll, which shows from uh, 1980s until about today. And the green line here says, man developed with God guiding. And the gray one at the top is God created man in the present form. So hypothetically, that's the creationist point of view. And the dark one at the bottom is man developed, but God had no part. And that's the one you see a little rise in at the bottom. So if we're to believe this chart, then in 2019, 40% of the American population says God created man in the present form within the last 10,000 years. Okay. However, this is not the only polling agency here. Okay, so now if we look, however, at the, at the Pew Research Center polls, there, there's a question then about, well, is this actually true or is this a perception? So if we look at, do you think science and religion are often in conflict? So people that are unaffiliated with religion that identify themselves as the nuns in ONES say that science and religion are in conflict 76% of the time. Um, whereas when somebody asks those same people, does it conflict with your own religious beliefs? Only 16% of them say it conflicts with their own beliefs. So the perception of conflict is enormous. And the same thing for the other side. 
right? Does, does science conflict with your own religious belief? Only 30% of US adults actually will say that science conflicts with their own belief. And there's a really interesting study in Pew because a few years ago, so Pew is considered a, a better uh, polling center than Gallup for religious polls. They've done a lot of the religious survey stuff in the United States and around the world, and they're really, really good about their survey methods. And they discovered a problem with their asking method specifically on this question a couple of years ago. And so if you look at their answers here, their first answer is they would have three, they would have two questions. Do you believe humans evolved over time or have humans always existed in the present form? And if you said they've always existed, then you're chunked right here at 31%. And if you said humans evolved, then you're asked, did God guide it or did God not guide it? Right? So they got about a 30 versus 70%, which is sort of lined up with Gallup. However, if they ask from the beginning three questions, did humans evolve with no help? Did God help it? Or did they evolve? Or did there no evolution at all? Then only 18% of people said that humans have always existed in their present form. And 20% sort of aligns up with people that self-identify saying that religion is in conflict with science. And so this number actually seems to be a lot more accurate than the 40% number that Gallup has said continues to be over time. But the, the main thing to get here, one is that perceptions have a lot of power in how people see the world and perceptions are not always accurate. And the other thing to think is that people are just really complicated and that we can often just hold different things at the same time even though they don't really make sense. It's just how people are. And science and faith are such big, important things, it's no surprise people are really complicated. All right. So there's one more piece to consider in setting the contemporary uh, discussion here. It's called the boom and bust of new atheism. So in the 1980s and 1990s, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, as books were being published about science and religion by people like Ian Barber and Alistair McGrath and John Polkinghorne, some fantastic theologians, a few outspoken atheists began to condemn the existence of religion itself. So starting with Richard Dawkins back in the 80s, a book called The Blind Watchmaker, uh, this movement became specifically known as New Atheism in the early 2000s and coalesced around the four men you see here who published a trove of books in the years after. Many in the religion science camp as well as many agnostics and atheists were put off by this militant version of atheistic philosophy but because of its militant nature, and because of its new nature, it gained a lot of traction and sold a lot of copies and garnered a lot of attention. Right, so these are Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Daniel Dennett, and Sam Harris. So some in the religion and science camp still see this line of argument as the most pernicious adversary in the 21st century, since the leading voices of the movement were trying to be the most pernicious adversaries to religion in the 21st century. Um, by committing to the idea of rationalism or scientism, the idea that science can solve all the answers in the modern world, and thus religion is pointless at best and harmful most of the time. But as you might guess, I do not agree that new atheism and their vision of reality is the biggest threat to the relationship of faith and science in 2020. For one thing, the leaders of the new atheism movement have pushed themselves from the conversation by adhering to ideas that are not seen in line with a multicultural movement for anti-racism, anti-misogyny, and anti-oppression more generally. So you can just see from some of these headlines, this is Adam Lee is, a, is, a, is an open atheist here, um, who's talking about Richard Dawkins' sexism. He just, I mean like 10 days ago, if you're on Twitter and follow Science Twitter at all, Richard Dawkins had this whole thing about eugenics that just got him like ripped apart from all sorts of people. Sam Harris, another one who's talked about racism and violence in terrible ways. Daniel Dennett talked in really glowing ways about the Iraq war and about the killing of Muslims and just a lot of really unsavory stuff. Um, and you only need to search for some of these things to see how much they're falling out of flavor. Oh, and that's a great, that's a great comic that I really like. And the comic says, uh, a true thing. If I tell the truth about everything, I will offend people false thing. Therefore, if I offend people, I must be telling the truth. He says, among scholars, this is known as the YouTube, or today we'd say the Twitter commentator's fallacy. 
All right. And for another thing here, so this is the chart of the rise of, 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 of the nuns here in ONES. So while the numbers of religiously affiliated, including atheist agnostics, which is sort of the bottom lines there, um, have been rising in the last 10 years, it is unclear to what degree this rise is dependent upon people like Richard Dawkins and not, say, the lingering abuse crisis in the Catholic Church or the Me Too issues in the Southern Baptist Convention or the LGBTQ stances among church leaders, climate change denial, or the fact that some people in power use the word Christian when bombing foreign countries and denying immigrants a place of safety. In other words, it is extremely hard to statistically verify the role of new atheism and the decline of Christians in the United States because of all the other issues going on today. So, so the role of faith that I'm proposing today requires one more, I got lost so many layers, I got another layer of understanding for you. One more layer of understanding, which is a question of the nature and values of science. So for this, we gotta go back one more time to 1960s, when, philosophy, uh, when philosopher and historian Thomas Kuhn was arguing against a purely objective and always progressive science. Ironically, he was arguing it's the same science that the new atheists use as the science for their backbone. They are using an objective and purely progressive science that was already being undercut in the 1960s. So Thomas Kuhn, um, who you might, might know from the idea of paradigms of science, which I don't really have time to go into, but you should look it up. So Kuhn challenged the notion that all science progresses in a linear or exponential fashion, even questioning the limits of science himself. So he asked a question like, does a field make progress because it is a science, or is it a science because it makes progress? How do we define what science is? And what he theorized was that five types of values. So we talked a lot about theory choice, right? How are theories chosen? If it's hard to know what science is, what good science is, how do we choose theories? And he hypothesized there's five types of values in science, accuracy, scope, simplicity, consistency, and fruitfulness. And these, these all have big meanings and stuff. Um, but this discovery, really opens the door for a new and fruitful understanding of modern science. That science is not some objective enterprise that lives apart from society. Science is part and parcel of culture. Always aiming for objectivity and always being objective in certain pieces, right? Two plus two is going to equal four. A cell behaves like a cell behaves no matter what. But there's always questions around it. Who chooses a theory? Where does the funding source come from? Why choose one research method over another? And all these other pieces naturally fall victims to societal biases and values. All right. And so Kuhn also says, he says, such reasons function as values and they can thus be differently applied individually and collectively by those who concur and honoring them. So the question of who concurs in defining science already becomes a point. So I'm gonna to point to four categories of, of values in science today to really push against this a little more and to see how this idea has developed over time. So the first one is in the selection of research areas. And there's a great book by Ian Hacking called The Social Construction of What? And if you know the research, he means social construction of science, but he wants to say what, as in pushing the, the idea. But it's a really powerful essay he talks about, and he talks about weapons development. He's giving a talk to military people. <laughs> And he says, it's not, it's not even just the fact that we diverted billions of dollars into weapons research and we got weapons from it. It's not even just that. It's one step further, which says, whatever we can think of, um, oh, it's on the other side here. Screw up here, see here. So if content is what we can see, like the weapons, and the form is what we can't see, the theories and structures that made the weapons, but which determines the possibilities of what we can see, then we have a new cause to worry about in weapons research. It's not just the weapons that are funded, but the world of mind and technique in which those weapons were devised. So it's not just the ethics of whether or not we develop a new nuclear weapon. It's the whole world that's being developed in order to get to the nuclear weapon. And what could those scientists have been doing otherwise? And what ethical responsibility does that make on us or on the scientists? The forms of that world can come back to haunt us even when the weapons themselves are gone, all right? So that's number one. 
Number two is the priority of funding agencies. This is a picture of the Large Hadron Collider, and I love the Large Hadron Collider, and it cost about 6.5. It did, like two years ago, cost $6.5 billion. It costs a lot more now. And it's not even the most expensive scientific experiment out there. Um, and the question of this, this picture is, is really just to raise the question of how much money and how much wealth it takes to do science. Science has always been done by the wealthy. That's not a critique of science, it is simply a fact of science. That science requires leisure. It requires people that do not have to contribute to society in a way that's buying or selling of goods, or I didn't mean it that way, Doug. <laughs> not have to contribute to society in a, in a immediately direct way, but can do research on the side to then have contributions and to see what that is. But unless you have enough wealth in a society to give somebody leisure to work for five years and then see the result, you're never going to have the science. And some scientific experiments require a lot more money than others. You know? So in the same breath that Jeff Bezos, for example, gave $10 billion to fight climate change, he also talked with Elon Musk about, and I think he already started his own new rocket ship company, right, to fly somewhere else in outer space. Science takes money, and people with money get to have a lot of influence on what science is. So number three is the choice of the values themselves that Thomas Kuhn talked about. So there's a uh, philosopher named Helen Longino that talks about values in science and critiques the notion of simplicity. And she says, the simpler theory is the one positing the fewest different kinds of fundamental entity or of causally effective entity. To suppose the social world is composed of just one of a few kinds of basic entity erases the differences among persons, including their social positions, that are fundamental to how they act. Right? So by, by erasing simplicity as a scientific value, you're actually forcing people to boil down what a theory should be like. And this is really seen in the very common E equals MC squared that we all, everybody loves to talk about is actually the absolute most basic form of that theory, which is much, much longer, and which then, you know, as opposed to the standard quantum model, which is something like this today, which is extraordinarily complicated, but quantum physicists seem to think this is pretty close to how reality looks, but it's not simple. And so what does that mean, and what are the values we have to hold up, and who chooses what those values are? And then finally, in Social Norms and Assumptions, there's a great book called Richard Dyer called White, and it talks about the development of photographic technology. And it says, different kinds of lighting have different colors and degrees of warmth with concomitant effects on different skins. However, what is at one's disposal is not all that could exist. Stocks, cameras, and lightings were developed taking the white face as the touchstone in the 19th century when this was happening. The resultant apparatus came to be seen as fixed and inevitable, existing independently of the fact that it was humanly constructed. So then actually a really recent example of this was Fitbit, got into a lot of trouble recently, I don't know if you saw this, is that their, their Fitbit sensors, they weren't, a bunch of people wrote, non-white people wrote, their Fitbits weren't working. And they came back that Fitbit actually hadn't done a lot of testing on black and brown skin. They had only tested their Fitbit on people of Western European descent. And just by doing that, had this whole huge issue of, oh, maybe we let some of these biases come into our development of this technology, and now how do we have to rewrite this technology, and what does this look like, right? So Dyer's text shows this, this clear link, right? And, but this link doesn't even account, and all these pieces don't even account for the origins of the entire fields of some sciences, right? The entire field of anthropology, sociology, and evolutionary biology, to name a few, that allowed racist and sexist assumptions to influence scientific work, right? So if we, if we summarize some of these values, we say broad research areas that affect decades of science, funding sources that inevitably influence directions of current science, which is also known as relying on the good billionaire hoping the good billionaire comes through and not the bad billionaire. Um, I know, it's not really too funny because we do really rely on that. Um, and scientists are influenced um, by taught values 
um, that are not fixed, and cultural biases directly affect technological development and the implementation of scientific ideas. All right, painted this sort of grim picture here. Um, now, this does not mean, I wanna clarify this here, it does not mean we need to use faith to undermine scientific consensus, nor does it mean that scientific consensus itself should be questioned, right? So none of this means that we should question climate change because values are present. In fact, one of the reasons I like working at AAAS right now is because there is a, there is a real understanding that this does exist within science. And the more that scientists understand that they can be biased in theory choice and in research areas, the more they can actively work to say, okay, what are those biases? <coughs> What's going on? And how do we counter those? You can really see this in recent work done on sexism within science, uh, choosing women scientists over male scientists um, in job applications or in research areas, and you know how much research is being done on men versus on women. There's been a lot of studies to try to narrow that gap and make that a lot more equitable in recent years. So this also, um, you know, using faith in science also does not mean using technology to help cover up abuse, right? Line the bank accounts of wealthy pastors or design better guns to protect people at worship. It also does not mean mistrusting scientists who are not people of faith or saying that only scientists of faith can make good science. It also does not mean interpreting metaphysics as science, like saying that a God hypothesis or something similar is required to make sense of the universe. No, the, the idea here is that faith on its own is a set of beliefs, a relationship, and a systematized way of understanding the world. But when placed with other people, faith becomes a set of ethics, and a moral, and a way of making decisions and ordering future priorities. Whatever your current or future state in life is, a growing faith should ground you, direct you, and help give you purpose. That doesn't mean that ethics are the only role of faith, but in relationship to the world, ethics are the way that faith often shows itself. So faith does not need science to make good ethical decisions, but this certainly helps, right? We can, all we have to do is look at the, the last 20 years of genetics, right? So in the last 20 years, um, the Human Genome Project, and more broadly, the field of genetic biology, has confirmed the thesis that all humans alive today are part of a single species. The publication of the Human Genome noted, and really confirmed it, it had been seen before, that any two individuals are more than 99.9% .9 identical in sequence, which means that all the glorious differences among individuals of our species can be attributed to genes um, in a mere 0.1% of the sequence. And of that 0.1%, a 2004 study showed that 87.6% of the total modern human genetic diversity is accounted for by the differences between individuals of a single population and only 9.2% between continents. So in view of these findings, the authors of the study see no reason to assume that races represent any units of relevance for understanding human genetic history. So now it's, it's possible, of course, to oppose racism without subscribing to or knowing anything about the theory of evolution or the genome. Many holy men and women, especially people of color, saw the theological necessity for the abolition of slavery long before the Human Genome Project. And it was partially from the influence of people of faith that 20th century scientists continued to pursue research projects concerning the equality of all humans. But the fact that modern science continues to affirm not only the common ancestry of humanity, but also the evolutionary interconnectedness of all life offers significant support to contemporary theological arguments against racial hierarchies. The church may not need modern genetics to make its case, but good theology has always been responsive to the discoveries of natural sciences. All right, so, so now we go to the place of faith here, and I want to go back one more time to the 1960s. So, this goes back to the less comfortable aspect of the history of religion and science, which is the history of racism. When the evolution creation debates emerged in the second half of the 20th century, they were dominated, as we saw, by white men and a few women. 
Despite the prominence of racial discussions in the 1960s, discussions of race were avoided by these theologians as much as discussions of eugenics, which is why this passage um, that I want to talk about today resonates so strongly with me. So eight years after the Montgomery bus boycotts, when Dr. King was touring the country, arguing for the right to vote, uh, the rights of the poor, and pushing for a more equal nation, he also discussed Darwin and the values of science in his powerful 1963 volume, Strength to Love. So I don't have time to go into this in detail. Um, but what he says is, is the 20th century opened with such a glowing optimism. People believed that civilization was evolving toward an earthly paradise. And Herbert Spencer skillfully molded the Darwinian theory of evolution into the heady idea of automatic progress. Men became convinced that there is a sociological law of progress that is as valid as the physical law of gravitation. So he goes on and on, and he says, since the bombs of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, we need something more spiritually sustaining and morally controlling than science. It is an instrument that, under the power of men's spirit, may lead men to greater heights of physical security, but apart from God's spirit, science is a deadly weapon that will lead only to deeper chaos. And the means by which we live outdistance the ends by which we live. Our scientific power has outrun our spiritual power. We have guided missiles and misguided man. Without this spiritual and moral reawakening, he finishes, we shall destroy ourselves in the misuse of our own instruments. Our generation cannot escape the question of our Lord, what shall a profit a man if he gain the whole world of externals and lose the internal, his own soul? So the entire debate about science and faith would be drastically better today had the professional theologians paid more attention to Dr. King and other black pastors than the internal debates among white intellectuals. But the poison of racism reaches through culture into both science and theology. And second, the reason MLK was and continues to be so impactful was because he was able to find a relevance for faith amid culture not by fighting against good science, but by giving a voice to those who have no voice, and thus offering an antidote to any future of eugenics, which is fighting for the poor, the disenfranchised, the sick, the homeless, the refugee, and the orphan. So following Dr. King's advice, Christians must continue to argue for the acceptance of evolutionary development and climate change in faith communities, not because people will be damned if they don't believe in evolution, but because faith itself will become irrelevant if people of faith cling to a countercultural interaction with modern science. The human endeavor of modern science can only improve with values that allow it to be mindful of loss, suffering, despair, and hope. And a lot of science is already very mindful of these things. Like other areas of society, we must resist the economic allure of new scientific directions that continue the vast inequalities of capitalism, like the cure-all, the next pill, or the new bomb that will solve problems previous bombs could not solve. Instead, Christians must openly and vocally continue to support science that prioritizes the weak, solves problems that affect the poorest parts of the world, and foregrounds the suffering of the few. As we return to the values that are laden with science, we see tangible but difficult places for future possibilities. In what ways are we complicit in the weapons of war? What funding areas are being suggested to agencies? And what could be suggested to agencies? What values are we teaching students of science? And how is this connected to biases of the past? And are we mindful of the poor and the pursuit of technology and process? Right? For, for example, while mental health professionals exist with excellent therapeutic resources, why is the access to these resources dependent upon your personal wealth or wealth or your local community? A Christian ethic of science must include access, funding, and equitable placement of health facilities alongside pushing for better health research in the first place. And as a very tangible example of this, if you saw the White House pre press briefing on the coronavirus just yesterday, the person in charge of this said, well, I, I can't determine how much it's going to cost, the virus, when it comes out, and how much the US government will be able to buy, because that amount has to be determined by the free market. And just the fact that that stance is there, 
is, is so terribly unequal and unfair and says already what's going to happen. And so either this is accepted or this is rejected and pushed against. So to close, let us reflect on a person that signifies much of modern American society, the rich young man from Matthew 19, who was the inspiration both for Dr. King's sermon and my talk today. And someone said to him, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said, why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. You wish to enter eternal life, keep the commandments. He said, which ones? You shall not murder, commit adultery, steal, bear false witness, honor father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said, I have kept all these. What do I lack? If you wish to be perfect, go sell your possessions, give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. When the young man heard this word, he went away grieving, for he, like us, had many, many possessions. Thank you very much. We have some time for questions. Yes. So I, I, I enjoyed hearing about the, I had never thought about why. So I'm a, I'm a biologist. I've taught this several times. And why, what, what's the purpose for Ken Ham and the Creation Museum and the Ark that's an hour north of us? Like what, why do you think after the 60s, I mean this was built about right. 10 years ago, what is it in the culture now that, that comes at that? Yeah, uh, so that's a, it's a big answer, right? So, I mean, part of it really comes down. So in the 1950s, besides, besides sort of the entrenchment of the two sides within Protestantism, of the creationists and the um, sort of pro-evolutionists, um, it, it, was, it was in some ways, so I, I, one of the sad parts is in seeing this, seeing this sermon from Dr. King in 1963 from one of his most famous books, and seeing that sermon never ever brought up by somebody in science theology, mm -hmm. I really do believe that one of the reasons why creationism as an idea flourished for so long was because the pro-science advocates did not address eugenics, right? And because they didn't, it left an opening for, I mean, I've read so many different tracts that were put out about how creationism is true because look at the eugenists, the eugenicists and the evolutionists in the 1920s and 1930s, look at the Scopes trial arguing against eugenics. And if you go read a book on evolution and God and it doesn't mention anything about being sorry about being pro-eugenics, then you're like, well, yeah, they're still covering it up. It's still there. So I think that's part of it. Um, and I think there's, there's a lot of other politics that go on to it and the change of public schools in the 1950s. Um, and there's also just a lot of money. Speaking of funding, there's a lot of people that, you know, really wealthy people that have very strong opinions on this idea and that sees science as this, this thing that is pushing this anti-Christian narrative. Um, there's a whole lot of reasons for it. You know, I, I, I do think that the most contemporary ones are really just because there is a few very, very wealthy individuals who see this is the only way they can keep this message going. And they're really, really good at reaching young people and reaching youth and getting into schools and that's been a really effective measure to sort of keep this up. And in the public schools, there's been sort of a general complacency about how much evolution we can put into elementary, especially elementary school. Most elementary science classes, all through seventh grade, in most states do not ever mention evolution. And it's a real travesty. I mean, it's, you know, and that's, that's you don't see that in other countries and you don't see the same percentages in other countries. So if the first time a student hears about evolution is in eighth or ninth grade biology, then already their way of looking at the world is already so set up, and then they get countered with this thing. So it's, there's a lot of pieces there, um, but this is this is one of the ones that doesn't often get talked about, which I do think is a is a pretty big piece too. Because even I was reading an article about Ken Ham's like two years ago where he kept pounding that eugenics thing, and nobody I even annoy a whole bunch of people on the evolution side by even talking about it in the first place. So yeah. Good questions. So just a, a possible expansion of, of one of the points you were talking about. I wonder if you would say um, one possible benefit for, for people of faith, and it wouldn't just be Christians, it would be all kinds of faith, who are scientists, 
you have the, the kind of values of science, the values of endemic science, some of those yeah. culturally informed, some from science itself or how it's been practiced. And you were talking about some of the blindness that can result from, from kind of just having those values, not questioning them, um, yeah. working from within them. Is, is there a possible benefit in coming from two different value systems, if you will? So, of course, yeah. faith often is also very much informed by its culture, et cetera, and you mm -hmm. talked about that a little bit. But still, there is endemic to Christianity certain values that it's hard to be Christian and not have. Yeah. So if you're a serious Christian and a serious scientist, you have one possible advantage where you're at least bringing to bear two different value systems that can help inform each other and make you more thoughtful about your value systems. Absolutely. So a whole other piece of this, and Helen Longino talks about this a lot, as do a lot of other people, is this question of the, the value of, of diversity within science itself and the value of having these different value systems coming together and how that actually makes science a richer place because ideas that were never conceived of by one rather homogenous group then come into play and new ideas are at play and new values come into being. And you're absolutely right. I mean, you can't. Part of this is, is sort of a, a constantly questioning, are there biases that are coming into my work? Are there biases that are influencing me into what I'm doing? Now, you know, if I'm, if I'm researching as, my, as my, one of my colleagues does, you know, the, the teeth of gorillas from Kenya, you know, it's, it's, there's not a whole bunch of values that are gonna go in to trying to determine a gorilla's age based on the tooth and finding markers for doing more paleontological work, right? So that, that really minute detail, you're already past a lot of those stages. And, and so the questions, but, it's, but being aware of that in the first place, right, is a big step for a lot of people um, and does get pushback from some scientists that are, are like, well, this, this never has anything to play with and never comes into play. But the fact is that your research is, is largely determined by your advisor, whose research is determined by their advisor, mm -hmm. and how it goes on and on and on. Even, even as somebody who studies humanities, I understand that I've, you know, there's a theoretical large amount of things I could research, but you choose one based on all, those, all these different ideas. That's what Kuhn was trying to talk about, mm -hmm. saying, what really does make us choose something, and how can we investigate that question? Thank you. A lot of the issue is that this sort of situation has fueled anti intellectualism in a lot of parts of the faith and a lot of you know, believers, especially in this part of the country, which in turn that anti intellectualism fuels this more. So we sort of come to a point where people in the faith are unable to, are afraid to ask questions. So that sort of ends up with a situation where people can have a faith, you know, a mile wide, but an inch deep, they don't actually mm. have the capacity to just have a question or take offense at there being a question. So what point in like the modern climate and everything, if it hasn't already happened, do you think there's going to be sort of a break? Well, I mean, I think, you know, where is it? So I think that the chart that, that shows this, right? I thought it's going to be a lot closer to get to it. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we're already starting to see the breaking point. You know, I mean, like, if people that are running churches continue to define their relationship to science as a combative nature, you're just going to drive intelligent young people from the church because they see the world of science. They understand that to, to accept the very latest developments of open heart surgery or network technology and reject climate change doesn't make sense in somebody's head. They're the same scientists, they're the same intellectuals. And so if you're preaching a world that doesn't exist, 
people are going to be driven away. And that's not even counting all the other stuff, like abuse crises and all the other pieces. So I, I think, yeah, in some ways, you know, people of faith, some people of faith have continued to teach this, this way that we have to be combative. We have to go against science. But if you look at the long history of Christian tradition, more than just the last 150 years, you see a Christian tradition which is constantly engaging the science of the day and constantly trying to understand the science of the day. And it's only really when the Christian tradition gets really wrapped up in notions of power and empire that these things become really, really problematic. You know? um, so, so yeah, I mean, there is an anti-intellectualism. -intellectual, there's also a budding white nationalism, and there's a lot of people that tie those things to Christianity. And it is going to continue to make this chart happen. You know, I mean, if I was 16 in high school and hearing this is the Christianity that's being preached, I'm not sure I would have kept my faith through my 20s. You know, it's a, it's a really hard thing. And it's even now, it's a choice to make each day as to what faith is. Um, so, yeah, it's an important question. I don't think there's a point. I think we're living in the midst of it. So we'll just sort of see, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. So then to kind of follow up, we, do you see a rise of, um, even in this generation, of people who are questioning, and bringing questions with science and with faith and kind of trying to bring them together? But you have previous generations who are still stuck in this mindset of either they're combating or that they can't fit together. How do you encourage the previous generations to um, be more accepting to the next generations who are bringing these questions? Well, I think, I think you don't fight the same battles, right? That's what I was saying about the creation-evolution discussion. I mean, I was talking to an anthropologist who helps one of our projects, and he was talking to a very, a very conservative seminary um, who was one of our scientists, and he was like, you know, honestly, I don't really care if people are creationists. What I care about is if people are using ideas that they think are true to be, you know, oppressive or misogynistic or homophobic or all these. This is what I care about. This is what actually matters to me. And you know, if you really want to believe the Earth was created 10,000 years ago, it's like, that doesn't, that doesn't really hurt me. You know, you're not going to have really scientists who might, you know, your children might really disagree with you or whatever, but it doesn't really hurt me personally. And so it's the other pieces that, that we can play into it and not just come back to the same battles over and over again. You know, one of the beauties of the program that I work with is that we don't force seminaries to talk about the hard topics. Right? If we have a really conservative seminary and they just want to talk about neuroscience and psychology in their pastoral classes, we say, great, we'll bring you a neuroscientist and a psychologist, and we'll talk about the most up-to-date neuroscience there is. And, and because just opening and connecting people to local scientists that are doing good active research is a step in that direction. And trying to pull science away from the big capital S science to science is scientists, it's people that are doing really good work. And the more you connect with them, then the more you're able to, to not just think about a talking head and think about a person doing science. And that's, and that's I think, where a lot of the, the connection can happen. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So um, you're finding a place for faith because you're identifying sort of gaps between the current practice of science and the use of our reason and our discernment tools at present um, that are moral gaps, really. Hmm. You know. And this seems akin to me to the earlier strategy of finding a place for faith by looking for explanatory gaps in science. You know, uh, and, and, and we learned uh, over time that this was an unwise strategy. Mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, mid 19th century, you're doing computations on how long the sun could keep burning given its mass under the assumption that it's doing some kind of combustion. Mm -hmm. And you get that it couldn't last more than a couple of thousand years. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and, and scientists had zero way to explain, you know, mm -hmm. how the sun was lasting this long. But they plead, give us time. And you know, sure. by the 1930s, they figure out nuclear fusion and. Right, and God of the gaps. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and so it's kind of unwise to sort of seize on any explanatory <coughs> gaps and say, aha, this is where we need uh, a particular belief to account for what we see. Um, could it be that what we now think of 
as a requirement that there be some kind of religious belief to ground and make possible subtle practices of moral discernment, of decentering, of checking one's assumptions, of, uh, of, 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 of practicing empathy and uh, you know, bringing in larger perspectives and other values that um, if we like look closely enough at how that's practiced in religious communities, we might actually be able to see how those tools can be incorporated, you know, actually mm -hmm. articulated, made available, and then used effectively by people who have no faith. Yeah, I mean, you're just, mm -hmm. you're, you're defining the use of ethical yeah. review boards, absolutely. Yeah. I think that is a, that is the only way that science as a whole is going to accept values like this. But I, I don't think I would go the next step. I, I don't think I would I would agree with the notion of saying like this is a moral god of the gaps because science from the outset, outside of people like Aristotle, you know, and, and there's always a few people, you know, is not trying to is not going to determine some scientific proof of a certain type of ethic. Right? In fact what we have seen in human history is that ethics change over time. And so but there's no real scientific reason why ethics change, except that some people stand up and say, no, this person should be counted as a person, or no, like, we shouldn't do a bunch of experiments on adult chimpanzees, or, or no, you know, all these other things. But there's no scientific reason why those ethical stances are, changed, are, are brought up. And I think that's becomes <coughs> the big difference. That I don't, you know, sure, in some utopia, you don't, you don't necessarily need God for everyone to be perfectly ethical. But in the practical lived world, I think, you know, I think I at least need an idea of God, a grounding somewhere that when I stray from the tools that I've, I have brought, this was Kant's whole problem, right? If you, if you boil down Christianity just to ethics, then you do. Kant's ethical program of Christianity was completely brought into progressivism and racism and cultural ideas of perfection, 100%. Because you can't boil it down just to ethics. But if you have the faith and the belief system and allow the ethics to be the way that you reach out to culture, then you do have a grounding that if all else fails, you can come back to that I think fuels that dialogue. Is it 100% necessary? Not in, not in utopia, but I think, and I think there's 100% dialogue with humanists and people that are doing this without a belief in God, and that's fantastic. That's why there's a lot of books written on this, this, this bottom population of agnostics and atheists often have very strong ethics and morals that are really essential to this kind of conversation. But I think there's a difference. There's a difference there, so. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you all much. What I'd like to do just for a few minutes is actually bring Dr. Fig up here and allow uh, some questions. If you were at the 11 o'clock hour and you had some questions about oncology and faith, or you see some connection between these two talks, this would be a great time to Or if he wants to get mad at me. Yeah. Join all these values and science. You can so just go, I'll give you the mic. You know, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to start, I'm gonna start answer this all the <laughs> with a question to Dr. Fig. So you work with oncology research, and undoubtedly you work with a lot of people who may not have a belief in evolution, but they don't doubt oncology. How do you think people can can, ad can adapt to a, an approach from faith to science that accepts the findings of a research medical program on the one hand, and at the same time be able to deny other kinds of scientific proof like in climate change and other things? Well, there are still some that don't believe in, in modern medical care, mm -hmm. uh, and there are, are, are small uh, religious groups that do, so we just have to deal with that. The vast majority of people, their scale of, uh, we're talking Christianity, their scale of what they believe with regards to evolution and, and the age of the earth and all, really don't affect their belief that uh, modern medicine will help them, they pray to God, that will help mm -hmm. them put those two together and they will be better. Yeah. John, want to make any other comments there? No, that's a great Okay. <laughs> Other questions that you have? Can I ask a, a question about your own sort of vocational direction? I know you're from a, a, an area of Kentucky, fairly conservative. 
religiously. Did you find uh, support for your pursuit in science to be supported by your community was a challenge? You know, I, my, my experience with regards to conservative uh, religious faith is, is that when I was growing up, things weren't as conservative as they have become. Mm -hmm. And I see that in, even driving through Georgetown now. If you just look at the, the churches, and the, there's one in a strip mall there on the left-hand side that uh, I saw. Things have changed over the last 40 years, and I'm not sure where that has come from. Okay? I know when I grew up, we never thought about those questions on on is there a problem with science and you just believe the, what the, the professor taught and they taught the, the correct things and there was never this conflict. Somewhere along the way, things have changed. And it kind of gets at a question you were asking and maybe I'm getting a little too political, but something has happened where um, there's some value to be an anti-intellectual for someone. And that bothers me. Mm -hmm. And I really worry that this is a political agenda that we shouldn't you know, strive to push our kids to go to the best schools because, oh, it may, you may end up with a, a liberal professor that may influence them. Something has happened in this country that I don't see, in my sons in Europe, I don't see in Europe. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I think it's, there's, there's a lot of pieces that have influenced, especially like in the last 10 or 15 years. And I think, I think a lot of it actually does come down to some of the pieces it brought up, which is like funding doesn't just affect science, right? Funding affects everything. And how, how money is used really, I mean, has always in human society, has always determined the nature of society. And as wealth inequality has grown in the United States, how that money is used has started to determine the nature of what society looks like. And I think that's, I think that's a lot of the difference. I think that's a lot from, from, if you look at sort of that inequality chart from the 1980s until today, it's a much less equal society and just how much people get paid and what this looks like. And so, so even a difference between a pastor and the people at church and what parents tell their children and what hope looks like in the thing, it's, it's a very different society. And there's a lot of other things that play there too. Um, but I think that's I think that's a piece of it, and and so science ends up becoming for some people sort of a battering ram of how to how to win votes or how to do something where where it should just be something that people can get behind for the betterment of humanity. And for a lot of fields, it still is. You know, there's very few people. I mean, people are still going to take away funding for oncology research. It still happens, but it's really hard to make that. You're not going to make that a center of your political speech. <laughs> Nobody's going to like that, you know. But they're still going to take the money away, you know. So it's still going to be a, it's still a fight that, that sort of goes on. But it also bothers me when people are going to profit off of a belief that is false. Yeah. So they set up an institute yeah. to promote false goods. Yeah. They're benefiting from uneducating America. That's hard. Any other questions? All right, let's thank our speakers today. We do have uh, some refreshments over here on to the side, some coffee, some water, some cookies. If you'd like to spend a few minutes chatting, that'd be great. Uh, thank you all very much. <laughs> Thank you.